Welcome everybody to the deep end. I'm Asad Serket. I'm the deputy editor at Curbed, which is a Vox Media network about design, architecture, and the places we live. I'm super stoked to introduce our next session, which is with Kara Swisher, who is, uh, as you all very likely know, the co-founder and executive editor at Recode. Um, she's going to be joined in conversation today with Esther Perel, who is an author and psychotherapist. And they're going to be talking about how tech affects our relationships. So that is platonic, romantic, and business relationships. Um, super stoked to have them here today. Before we begin, please do make sure to silence your cell phones. Um, even though we're going to be talking about tech, we don't need to get meta with hearing sounds go off as they speak. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm going to let them take it away. Thanks so much. <laughs> Right? You're married to a southern man, and they call it, what do they call it in the south? Do your American voice for us, please. Hey, Esther. Okay. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> I like it that way. Um, I was telling her she's lucky we don't call her Essie, um, which is really a horrible name. Um, sorry to all the Essies in the house, but it is. Um, so we're going to talk about a lot of things. We're going to focus, obviously, on tech, because uh, uh, Esther has a lot of thoughts about this. But we're going to have a wide-ranging interview. And I just literally got off the stage with Christiana Amanpour, where she has a new series called, on the main stage, uh, called uh, Sex and Love Across the World, or something like that. And literally, all we talked about were orgasms. And so I'm ready for this discussion. Um, so, uh, and she complimented Esther on stage quite a bit about the work you've done. So let's start just in general. Everyone knows who you are, but talk about what your focus is now, and then we'll get into tech and all, and questions from the audience and things like that. So there's different focus. I, um, I just finished a book called mm -hmm. The State of Affairs. Right. Um, I just yesterday launched the new se second season of my podcast, Where Should We Begin? Right. Um, which is unscripted, anonymous couples therapy sessions. So right. it was the first attempt to bring a therapist's work into a digital form. Um, I said three years ago that my next subject would be men. Okay. And people didn't find it very interesting. Okay. And, uh, and now they do. Right. <laughs> so um, that's where I'm beginning to, I'm creating conversations. Much of my work is about creating conversations right. about the stuff that we don't talk about. Right. And one of the conversations that needs to happen is a conversation about power and sex and the, and the, the oldest power exchange structure that has existed between men and women, right. but together. So let's talk first about, uh, we, we're going to get to Me Too for sure, um, but let's talk about this idea of you first doing uh, digital conversations. Tell me how that came about because people have been, We've had Dr. Ruth, we've had all kinds of sex therapists around, mm -hmm. uh, around the globe. Yeah. Um, how did you think about doing that and why that, in that format? So my transition from the, the work of a couples therapist working in my practice and working primarily in the clinical world to entering this digital world is literally three years. It's mm -hmm. actually very short. But I had done teleclasses. Mm -hmm. I used to teach therapists all over the world. I've trained therapists for umpteen years. And then at one point, I met with my co-founder, with Lindsay Rotowski, and I said, why don't we once do something like that for the general audience? No, I can't see all the people who want to meet. I know that from the TED Talk, people are writing to me from all over the world in places where there is no information, and that all over the world is inside the United States, too. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, and I think I, have, I, I can offer something. How do I do it without losing my soul? Right. Like, how do you trade scale for, for, and maintain the integrity? And so we launched the first webinar. From the webinar, we began to develop online courses. And, um, and in those courses, these are the conversations that people are not having right. around love and sex mm -hmm. um, in its multiple nuances. And you, bringing them on was a very, it was innovative, it, it, bringing the couples on. Was that difficult to get people to do that, or what was? Um, so 
the Rekindling Desire course is, doesn't have live couples. The, web, the podcast, we partnered with Audible, mm -hmm. and um, the first time we just posted on social, and uh, we had the f maybe a hundred something people, or maybe more, by this, but they hadn't heard it. Right. These are not my patients, so that I'm not beholden by the confidentiality. They know exactly what they sign up for. And they often wanted the opportunity to work with me, and it was a way to work with me for free and to be brought to New York and to have, for me to have the opportunity to work with people from all, all, all over the U.S., not just urban Americans as well, and really cover a diversity of, of backgrounds in every aspect. Um, straight couples, trans couples, gay couples, every color and every class. Uh, which you don't always get to do that much. Right. I used to have it at NYU, and I missed that. Right. Um, now we so have... it's just like overbred New Yorkers you are yes, helping, yes, right? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. And then now I know we, them. it's in the thousands. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's thousands of people who want to participate, and now they've heard it. So the, fir the second season, it's people who heard it, and then they said, I want something like that. I want to experience this. Mm -hmm. So it's a very different... Um, experience the ones who applied without having known what this was going to become and the ones who applied because they had been immersed in the experience and they said maybe this could help us right so let's talk about that because you know I want to get into the online space the idea because we're going to talk about tech bros and relationships I got a great question online about why maybe there's a lot of sexism because they can't have relationships which I think is a bit of a canard I'm not I'm not clear but uh, talk about the commonalities of what you found because you're getting a wider audience and 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 this we'll get to your new book about it's about infidelity correct right um, it's about relationships through the lens of infidelity okay it's really right. the broad uh, okay um, so talk a little bit about the commonalities that you found getting to this broader audience and, and I hate to use the term scalable but you've made yourself scalable it's millions of people right. in um, 180 something countries and territories. It's uh, very interesting to know that uh, almost more than 40% of listeners are men. Mm -hmm. um, and they're in every remote country from Chad to, <laughs> it's just like, um, that is incredible. Um, because it is a public health campaign on relationships. Mm -hmm. It started out as a creative project but it actually became something way, way, way bigger. Right. Um, that and the TED Talks, right. I wish to say, I've kind of, um, you know, it's thousands of letters as well, so I hear it, I see. And I work internationally. I work in seven languages. I don't need translation, so I actually have access to diversity. Um, it's everything. It's uh, the commonalities, the human experiences, the major dramas of our life are not different. But what changes are the way we narrate our pain, the interpretation we give to it, what gets weight and what doesn't, uh, the extent to which we think we should suffer or the extent to which we think we're entitled to be happy. Mm -hmm. um, the larger values that predominantly that are dominant within the West individualistic cultures and the more collective cultures is what really translates all the way straight into your sheets. Mm -hmm. So talk about those relations. <laughs> talk about those relations. What do, you, what do you think the predominant thing you're dealing with now? And we'll get to online because I think online has sort of messed up everything. Or maybe it hasn't. Maybe it, from your perspective it hasn't. How do you look at the way relationships have changed um, in the past few years? Okay. Um, by the way, my keynote yesterday was on that, and it's up on, on YouTube. But it's an incredible, in a very short amount of time, massive changes have taken place. Um, people marry for love. Um, people tie sexual satisfaction with marital happiness. We have contraception. We can separate sex from reproduction for the first time. We root sexuality in desire within long-term relationships. Uh, male privilege and double standard by which they have always had a license to cheat and nine countries still will kill women just for straying. Um, for the first time, actually, infidelity rates have changed primarily because the rate of women has gone up by 40% because we have divorce laws, because we have economic independence on women. Monogamy used to mean one person for life. Today, monogamy is one person at a time. Okay. Uh, I mean, it just That's is... how I look at it. <laughs> 
It's, and, and if you travel the world, you literally see the changes, you know, along every one of these dimensions of relationships. The place of children, the number of children, the meaning of sex as it associates to children. It's not the same when you have eight kids and when you have one or two. Mm -hmm. um, it, there is just about no unit that has transformed more in a hundred years than the couple. So talk about that. Where, where are we now? And I want to get to the online part of it because I think it has the, all the, the grinders, the tinders, the, all the various things that have happened where people meet and communicate online. Um, talk a little bit about that, how that has transformed, because well, I don't, maybe you don't think that's the case, that relationships remain the uh, same no, online no, no, and offline. I mean, you know, there is a conversation about that. Is the dating different, but the mating is the same? Okay. Or when the dating changes, does it also change the mating? Right. Um, and I don't think that we know all these answers at this moment. But what we do know is, uh, if I have a choice between two people, it's rather limiting. In the village, I had a choice between two people. Um, later, I had a choice between six or 10 or 15 people, and that was a lot better. When I have a choice between 1,000 people, it's crippling. Yeah. So I'm on the one hand looking for the soulmate. We're looking today for the one and only. That one and only is supposed to be the one that's going to cure you of your case of FOMO, you know, <laughs> with whom um, you have never called anybody soulmate besides God. Now it's right. become your partner right. with, that is going to fulfill you. It's not just a person with whom you're going to have the basic needs of Maslow, not even the belonging needs of Maslow. It's the self-fulfillment needs that are going to come on. And you're doing it with a romantic consumerism whereby, you know, you're constantly doing this, checking if there is nothing better there. And basically, the ritual of commitment becomes deleting the apps. Mm -hmm. Ritual commitment. Meaning, meaning I found the one. Right. I can stop searching. Right. I can delete my app. Right. Does that happen? <laughs> Ask them. No, it does not. <laughs> It does not. It does not because it creates. So, what does that change in the in the way people relate to each other then in that environment, with with endless choice? Essentially. So, I think that it has created one. It, it does a lot of things, but one of the phenomena that it has created um, that is very very interesting, which is a, what I've I've come to call stable ambiguity. So, I meet you, mm -hmm. I date you, I like you. I can kind of simmer you, mm -hmm. you know, so we can meet on occasion, but i simmering a few others as well. Simmering? Yes, simmering. Okay. It's like cooking a petit four. No, I know what simmering is. In French. <laughs> <laughs> I can you know, simmer. Um, I can and, simmer cooking, the other one I can't do. <laughs> and I am with you just enough so I don't have to feel lonely. I've got this relationship in New York, but it isn't really going anywhere. And I have another one in LA, and it's nice when I'm in LA, but it isn't also going. This stable ambiguity is just enough <laughs> constancy and just enough involvement so that I don't have to feel the loneliness that mm -hmm. pervades my life, and not too much so that I don't feel that I have made a commitment by, by which I have foregone my freedom. Mm -hmm. And that stable ambiguity becomes one very common dating pattern in the moment. Is this a good thing, or do you, you don't have judgment? <laughs> I think that... <laughs> I mean, um, I can see you go. Uh, no, no, no. It's it's because it, it, the world isn't dividing good and bad. I think um, I can say that I have rarely heard people tell me it's phenomenal. It feels great. Mm -hmm. I don't. Right. I, but they can't really say it's degrading. It actually is a half full. It's fast food, and fast food feeds you, but afterwards leaves you with a bad taste. Mm -hmm. um, because it's not okay to say these things today. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to be able to pretend that you can be a happy consumer. Right, with that. So what has to change in them? I mean, do you, what do you think of when you look at the Tinders, and the, which becomes gamification of dating, essentially, or gamification of relationships? But look, we, we, it's been a long time since we shifted from procreative to recreative. So right. I think there's always been a moratorium period. The moratorium period today has extended from, you know, about 15 years of sexual nomadism. Mm -hmm. If you do it with apps or if you do it in bars, or it, it does make a difference. But the fundamental is experimentation without outcome. Right. After that, you still, most people still at some point want to build a story mm -hmm. with a person. Right. 
you know, and love stories are one thing and life stories are something else. All right. And at that moment, the question is, to what extent has the 15 years of nomadism helped me in creating a more committed relationship with whom I'm going to build something versus it actually has on some small level fucked me up. Right, right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'd say the latter. And I think that it varies by the people. By the people. I think it varies by the people. So how do people look at relationship with couples now once they get past the nomad period of their they life? They have unrealistic expectations. It goes from a period of such disaffiliated relationships in mm -hmm. which you are meant to have, it's like a race to the bottom. Mm -hmm. How can I have connections with people with whom I feel the least? Okay, yeah. And then go to the finding of the soulmate and the one. Right. And this is the two extremes, I think, in which a lot of people live. Do you relate to these people? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, just yeah. want to make sense. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> no, they're all totally happy in their relationships. I can't see them. I don't have no. my glasses. Uh, we're going to ask them questions in a minute. We're going to ask in groups of questions because Esther wants to see a theme. But when you're, but, so do you blame technology for this or do you think it's just humanity as they just get more tools? to find more, or, or, or should, should something be fixed about it in order to get people? I think technology is a manifestation of the world of options. Right. Our world of relationships has shifted from a model that was organized around duty and obligation to a model that is around freedom and choice. And the choice just keeps getting bigger. None of us seem to want to go back to the previous era. No. But we all understand that the massive amounts of choices that we have have left us with a tremendous sense of uncertainty, a chronic ailment of self-doubt, and constantly, is, how do I know? How do I know it is the person? You know, because now I only have myself to rely upon. I have to make all the big decisions that used to be made for me. And this is actually a psychological shift. It's not for nothing that people feel exhausted. Mm -hmm. It's just not because they've been swiping, swiping. Right. You know, that doesn't tire you. It's the, it's the knowing. It's the figuring out who am I? What do I want? What do I need? Is it really what I need? Is what I need what I think I need? Wow. How happy am I when I need this thing? <laughs> and when I find it, how do I know it is the thing that I was looking for? <laughs> that was just one of Esther's sessions. Just so I can see, like in mind. <laughs> Um, okay, I'm exhausted by that. Um, uh, so what do you, how do you get to that successful? And then I want to talk about the mistakes we've made, and I do want to talk about Me Too also. Um, even though we've talked about it a lot, I think we need to talk about it all the time until everyone's completely exhausted by it. Um, but talk about what then make, how do you move into a successful relationship? I think that the, the, the first thing is um, it, there is no perfection. There is no the one. There is a one that you meet at some point with whom you're going to write a story and you could have written another one. Mm -hmm. And the beauty is that today we can actually write two or three stories in the course of our life, and many for that matter. Uh, and sometimes with more than one person at a time as well. So that's the first thing. And then you understand that optimization is not the only model. Contentment goes a long way. Mm -hmm. uh, so what they call satisfizers, as my friend Logan Nuri just said. You know, there is something about, let me see where this takes me, rather than, is this it? Mm -hmm. And then go with it and explore yourself. And don't think that you know it all immediately just because of the picture or just because of the first date. Relationships take time. They are experiences that are iterative processes. I say, you respond, I check on your response, I gauge you, I bring in something else. It's iterative and reiterative. And this is the thing that we have really lost with the digital. The digital is flat. It's two-dimensional. Right. You don't have to see. You don't have to sense. So, and we know that people's communication online is massively distorted. They think, they are sure they understood what the other person said. Yeah. And all the sociolinguistic studies tell you they don't. No. So this is part of what you lose. So once you get off the app, you meet a person. And then the rest is your experience with the person. But more and more, we have lost yeah, I agree. skills. It's, it's, it's an we interesting, lose skills. It's an interesting thing. My son met his first girlfriend on Snapchat, which I found disturbing in every single fashion. Um, and 
And then they met in person, and it was a disaster. I mean, you know, now he has, although now he refuses to call anyone a girlfriend, but that's another, I'll bring him in. Um, but, I have two. Yeah, yeah. Um, but no one's a girlfriend. Like, it's, I don't even understand it anymore. Um, but it was interesting, because I was like, you can't really get to know someone on Snapchat, but he did feel like he had a connection. It was an interesting, because there are connections. There are connections you make online with people that are very rich, can be very rich. Absolutely. You know. So let's talk about um, also not just the, that you that this is a flat communications tool, but it also gets in the way of relationships now. Um, I have I, I have an issue with my phone. I, I admit it. I use it all the time. I, I like it near me. I pet it a lot. Um, it's it's not the best relationship I've ever had, but it is. Um, it, so people are this gets in the way. This idea, and you see it around South by Southwest. Can yes, it's technology in the bedroom. The amount of people the last thing they stroke before they go to bed is their phone and the first thing they stroke before they go when they wake up is their phone mm -hmm. so it's a really it's a it's a choreography I mean basically um, I'm here you know I take the phone yeah uh, and when I wake up in the morning I do this instead of actually spooning you right and um, or as one of the, my patients recently said, you know, it's like every night I go to bed and she's on, on Instagram in the bed with the, and it's like, I'm lonely. Mm -hmm. I just want to, to talk, to chat, to connect. Mm -hmm. And she's just like getting lost and zoned. And it creates a new definition of loneliness. You know, mm -hmm. they talk about loneliness all the time at this moment. It is the public health crisis number one. But what they really are distinguishing is that it no longer has to do with being socially isolated. It has to do with experiencing kind of a loss of trust and a loss of capital while you are next to the person with whom you're supposed to not be lonely with. Mm -hmm. And so you're lying there. You know, when your partner went to work and stayed at work till midnight, you knew that they were not there. Mm -hmm. Now they're home, but they're not really present. Right. And, what we, and we call this, in, in psychology, we call it ambiguous loss. Mm -hmm. Ambiguous loss is what you feel when a person is physically present, but psychologically gone, like Alzheimer. Mm -hmm. But the same thing happens when your person is lost. Looking at Instagram. In inst they're lost. Mm -hmm. you, can't, you talk to them and they don't hear you and they don't answer you and they're physically present. And that is a very confusing experience. Ambiguous loss is also the reverse, is when somebody is psychologically gone, uh, psychologically present, but physically gone, like when they're kidnapped. Right. Okay, so... Like when they're stayed, kidnapped. <laughs> yes, like okay. when they're when yeah. you're in, in situation. Right. But the point is, you, then you, you don't know if you need to let go or if you have to hold on. Right. That's why it is so, such a stressing thing. Should I call for attention while you're in your Insta, lost, or should I actually just accept that I'm on my own? And, and you stay and you wait for them to end, to close it, to turn around, to turn off the light, to connect with you, and they don't. And when that happens, night after night. What do you advise then? What do you do? Do you grab the phone and run? What do you do? That's a psychological In this tool. case, I, I, I basically said, uh, the first thing I think I said, which wasn't so clear, I, because he didn't say it like that either. He just says, it annoys me. That I, and I just said, you're lonely. Mm -hmm. You're lonely. You know, to sit there next to someone because it's gone on. Then I said to her, do you know he's lonely? Does it matter to you? Right. Because I can't imagine that that's actually what you intend to do. You know, and what would happen if instead of watching what everybody else is posting, you actually checked in with him for a moment mm -hmm. you know do you think you do you worry that you're going to lose yourself or anything you, you just engage in a conversation that is not about blame that allows people to reflect that allows people to take responsibility that banks on their good intention and then you say you're going to try three things differently and let's see which one of them works because i don't know what will work better but i can tell you that if you continue this i can tell you where you're going to end up mm -hmm. and what was the response from your perspective it's it's so common this is such a common issue now you know you you look the greatest in invention that was ever made in Western civilization was the invention of the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Somebody understood in one of the oldest creation story that you needed a day off. Mm -hmm. Because when you stop, it's not just that you take a break, it's that you recharge. You, it's, you, know, you restore, it like, and you build back. And when you never stop, 
something begins to happen to your brain. That is not, I, it, it's, this is like couch neuroscience, but it's, it's kind of out there yeah. at this point. And you basically explain the same way, how do you tell people that it's not healthy to eat McDonald's every day? Mm -hmm. It's yeah. a whole education. Right. And you basically say it's going to destroy your relationship. Right. Um, do you want that? If you don't, I can actually give you a few ideas. Get an alarm clock. Mm -hmm. When you go for dinner with him, leave your phone in your bag. Don't put it on the table and certainly don't take it with you when you go to the bathroom because mm -hmm. you end up staying there 20 minutes. Right, yeah. You know, while That's he's the sitting... That is the national emergency, okay? bathroom lines, because <laughs> of, of Instagram. And instead of texting back and forth 50 times the amount of time that takes, just pick up the phone and talk for three minutes and arrange mm -hmm. it. It yeah. actually, you know, the voice, the loss of the voice, the voice is really the first thing that the baby hears in utero. We need the voice. It's the most soothing things. People don't hear the voice. Call, call, you know. Um, you, and you basically say, would you do that with me for a week? I am trying to write an article, mm -hmm. and I would like to see if it would make a difference. Mm -hmm. Would you like to be a participant in my study? Mm -hmm. And then after a week, they come back and you say, did it make a difference? And then you say, what would it take for you to continue and do that? Right. And then you, you now, know. Now, do most people say, I make suggestions, does anyone come say, no, I really do like my phone better? No. No. No, the, 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 it actually, you know, um, the majority of people feel calmer. Mm -hmm. The first thing is they feel calmer. They're not constantly thinking that they need to, there's something important that they need to be in touch with. It allows them to be more present. It allows them to learn to self-soothe. It, it does a lot of things. There's nothing wrong with the phone. I love my phone too, you know. So, but there is something about... Um, Basically, at this point, people are primarily in triangular situations. They mm -hmm. are rarely just with the person that they're with. Right. So they're cheating on their partner with All their the phone. All the time. Yeah. All the time. Phone. Yeah. So talk about the, the infidelity book. What, what were you trying to get to? I don't recall. You said it's beyond that. Can you talk about what, what you were trying to get so, Your last book was Mating in Captivity. Mating in ca I've written <coughs> Mating in Captivity. I've written The State of Affairs. And mm -hmm. primarily what I do is I study modern relationships. I study also what are the expectations that we bring to relationships, how have our mentalities changed, um, and what is the, in the dance between love and desire in relationships. And particularly I study desire because it is one of the most organizing principles of our Western societies, so too in everything that technology does. The mating in captivity was about the dilemmas of desire inside the relationship, and the state of affairs looked at what happens when desire goes looking elsewhere. Here is this subject called infidelity. It has existed since marriage was invented, so too the taboo against it, and it is treated in the most reductionistic, you know, um, black and white victim perpetrator model, something that affects almost half the population worldwide in every model of marriage. Probably more than half of them. You know, yeah. um, we will never know because men lie up and women lie down. <laughs> um, men exaggerate in their lying and women diminish in their lying. So right. we will actually never really know. And the questions that are asked are very misleading. So I wanted the stories behind and I wanted to create a new conversation for the oldest sin that embraces the complexities of infidelity and does justice to the millions of people who are in the throes of it and in the pains of it. So what is the most difficult part of that? Because a lot of it has to do not just with the infidelity, but it's the lying and the hurt and the cruelty a lot of the time. That can go with it. Yes. I mean, what is so difficult around infidelity, like in many other aspects of relationships, is that it's two people experiencing one event in completely differentiated ways. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that they can share about it. So, you know, sometimes I am lying to you, but I have the experience that maybe for the first time I've stopped lying to myself. Right. right. And how do I tell you that? So the difficulty around the subject is how do you create a dual perspective? What it did to you and what it meant for me. And at the heart of affairs, there is lying and deception and gaslighting and a breach of trust and a violation and all of that. But at the heart of affairs is also often yearning and longing and loss for the person that I once was and have not met in so many decades, for reconnecting with a sense of aliveness, for vitality, for intensity. Right. In, for a good way. In, a, in, a, yes. in a good way. So we should give Donald Trump a break on the porn star. I think we should. <laughs> 
<laughs> Don't laugh at me, Esther. No, not we should not. <laughs> we should not give him a break on the porn star. No, okay. Right. <laughs> Infidelity is one thing, right? And this is a different thing, which I will let you name. Okay, I don't know. I want you to name it. You're the relationship expert. Crass. Crass. Okay. Crass. Crass. Okay. All right. Okay. That's a good word. Um, so when that happens, when you have that, what are some exploitation, of the, manipulation, right? Yeah. Power trips. Power trips. Misogyny. Well, let's get to that. Let, I mean, it has names. It's not yeah. new. So talk about that. What's happening now with the people talking out? I mean, it was this. What happened with Donald Trump happened millions of times, and people paid off and kept people quiet. And the same thing with Me Too. When you look at what's happening now, is that very different? The, the voices of Me Too, the voices of Time's Up. Um, what do you imagine is occurring now? Because it feels like an earthquake in male-female relationships. I, you know, it's interesting because when you write about infidelity, you write about consensual relationships. Right. It is really not a situation of harassment. That's kind right. of seduction is one thing. They're often conflated, though. Yes, and mistakenly. Right. Mistakenly. I mean, infidelity are generally consensual experiences. Um, and they are experiences of seduction. They're not experiences of harassment. Mm -hmm. You know, that is where they part. Now, I think that there's something very beautiful, as in powerful and important happening, in us challenging or taking on or taking, putting under intense scrutiny the oldest power exchange system, which was that forever men traded social power for sex. For sex. Often the sex that they would not have been able to have right. if they could not compensate. Mm -hmm. Which is why I think there's something, and, and I'll finish my thought first, and women traded the power that was available to them, which often was youth and beauty and sex, for access to the social status and power that was denied to them. This has been an old economy. And What's important about that to understand is that sexually powerful men don't harass, they seduce. It's the insecure man mm -hmm. who needs to use power in order to leverage the insecurity and the inaccessibility or the unavailability of the woman. Women may fear rape and men fear humiliation. Mm -hmm. So you're saying these people are insecure the the ones that the, the stories that it's yes based in that underneath the use of power lies a deep sense of powerlessness mm -hmm. and then you manipulate and you exploit the power that you have in order to cover that it's you know it's like the way I look at power dynamics is the way that you play pool. Mm -hmm. If you want one ball to hit the hole, it is never that one that you need to kick. Mm -hmm. Things are not pushed by the stuff that is linear. It's something else that needs to push this thing. This is the way power dynamics work. What you see on the surface is a powerful man. What is in reality is a man that is suffering <laughs> from, suffering is maybe a nice word, but you know, from yeah, lack of, and then uses the power available in basically harassment is a form of erotic sadism. Mm -hmm. That's a great way of putting it. That so is what, what it is, what, because what, it's the difference from it's rape. It's interesting that, you, but you're not casting him as a victim, because I think most people just want to kick them. Like, Why is it, they, that doesn't victimize the person right. at all. It just gives a more accurate description of what's going on. Of where you, be, you know, of what may be activating this. Right. Why would a person, you know, put you in a situation in which every day when you come to work, you don't really know what you're going to expect. Right. Do, is it, will this be a normal day? Or will this be one of these complete slimy, icky days in which the entire time you want to take a shower? Right, right. I think you understand the difference. Right. And the whole sadism is that you don't know. Right, right. So what ha what's going to happen next? And then we'll get to questions from the audience. What do you imagine happening next with this? Where does it go? Is it unprecedented or has it happened before and then it dies down? Because you, you're talking about it as an economy, and you're absolutely right that this is a power economy. How does the economy shift? Because economies have shifted many times. Always. I mean, for me, when I try to understand it, and I look at other norms that have changed. You know, powerful social norms that shifted. Corporal punishment. Mm -hmm. Many people, maybe even in this room, may still have been part of a system that believed that if you get your butt kicked, it builds character. Mm -hmm. 
that is no longer the norm. No. How do we shift a norm like this? And you watch norms. You Gay know? marriage. I, I, you took, literally yeah. took it out of my mouth. You know, for me, those are two very powerful examples because it's multifactorial. It, you don't change it from one place. You know, for me, it is about two things. We have done a lot of work for the past 40 years helping women, girls, find their voice and their power. But it needs to be matched with helping boys, not helping. It is our responsibility as a society to stop stripping boys of their emotionality starting at age four. Mm -hmm. Mothers mm -hmm. first. Yep. We touch our boys less than we touch our girls. We strip them, literally, of their connectivity, of their need for others, so that we can instead put in there a making of a performance-based masculinity about fearlessness, mm -hmm. competitiveness, self-reliance, and all the stuff that we then know has all kinds of deleterious effects just on themselves, regardless of, of harassment. Right. And we, if we, if we, the lives of women will not change until the lives of men changes too. Right, I agree. These things are interdependent. And so the notion for me that is maybe a little different where we say they need to be quiet now, they, 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 this is their time to listen and to shut up. No, this is their time to finally have the right to have conversations about themselves and about masculinity and the making of manhood and the definitional voids that is pervasive around manhood so that we can create a more true equality. No, you're 100% correct. I think it's really, it's hard to get because um, right now in Silicon Valley, it's just like I can't say anything. I have so many yeah, men that's... saying that to me, which I'm like, stop it. You certainly can't. So I've it. done fear. conversations like that. I've right. led a bunch of these conversations from 80 to 1,000 people where I bring, literally create fish bowls and have the conversations about the stuff. Listen, often when, we, when men end up talking like this, um, it's not just that they've never said it to anybody else. In the majority of cases, they've never even uttered it out loud to themselves. Mm -hmm and it is powerful. And that is, for me, where, where the, the intersection and is. And with each other, place. and talking about it with each yes, other. Yes, with each other, with each other. Yeah, I just had an instance with my son. I was just talking to him before walking over here, and one of his friends did something to a girl that wasn't welcome, and his first thing, his friend's first thing was like, I didn't do it that way. And my son, which, I mean, honestly, I think all, as I've said before, all men should be raised by lesbians. Um, but um, <laughs> it's true. He said, well, I, you really have to stop treating women badly, and here's why. And he had a discussion with his friend, and I thought that was much more powerful than the woman of course, who he bothered. Of course. I, I thought it was a really interesting... So I go into companies, and I work on relationships, and I work on relational intelligence, and I do it with co-founders, and I mean, there's, my way is through conversation, because if you no longer have rules and set up structures of power and social hierarchies, the only thing you have to deal with relationships is conversations, mm -hmm. negotiations. And that needs to be learned. Those things are not innate. Some things are, though. The t uh, talking and the way people communicate, the way the companies are set up, are much more aggressive. I mean, they just are. Um, it's innate that we learn vocabulary. It's yeah. not innate that we learn to express our vocabulary to someone who in your presence is having another experience than you. Right, that's true. <laughs> All right, let's get questions from the audience. Let's get three or four questions uh, quickly. Hands up, come on, I know you have relationship questions right here. <laughs> Hi, uh, <coughs> hey there. Um, just starting from where, where we are, you speak a lot in both of your books about the, um, the effects of feminism I think on intimate relationships, and I don't want to misparaphrase you, but um, Put the mic a to yeah, just that you you talk about the way that I think that that feminism in society has possibly uh, affects relationships between men and women, and that um, that equality or equanimity is not necessarily the thing that makes for good sex. Is that fair to say that you in in your books that's something you so then. Looking at where where society is going now, I mean this kind of amazing moment. Do you do you currently see in your practice the way that the either Me Too movements or um, the the sort of the sea change that's going on? Do you see that trickle down into practice yet, or do you have an anticipation about how that might either positively or negatively affect um, intimate relationships? Okay, just a second. Is there another question? So we can see if there's another. Right there behind you. Hand it back. 
Hi. Hi. Um, I have a question. I'm, I'm a chef, and I usually work in an environment with a lot of men mm -hmm. that behave with this macho culture that you're describing. How do you go to talk about these men and how you feel without um, them feeling that you're attacking in any way, that you just want to create a better environment for, you know, for um, the future generations? Uh, how do you go and express yourself in a way that is not, uh, that they don't perceive that you're uh, a threat yeah. uh, great, to the environment? Great the attack question. thing. Great question. Yeah. All right, yeah. let's do those two. Okay. Um, so what I have said is not at all something that links feminism to desire. What I have said is that um, sexual desire is not always politically correct. And it doesn't always abide by the rules of good citizenship. Meaning <laughs> that, but it is, but, but when, you're playing the, when you're talking about desire, and when you're talking about sexuality, you, under, you can't strip power from sex. But it is a play on power. That is the complete difference. You know, everybody's wondering why is it that some people would demonstrate during the day against certain things that they would totally delight at night? Because that is the difference between reality and play. You know, we do in our fantasies sometimes want to experiment with the very same things that for the life of us we wouldn't want to experience in, in reality. And that juxtaposition is very important to keep in mind. You know, I want equality in my salaries, in, my, in, the, in the responsibilities that I get, in what people think I'm capable of, etc., etc. And when I am in a sexual interaction, I want to be able to experience a different hierarchy in which there is no more powerful position than voluntary surrender. But the key word is voluntary. Mm -hmm. Giving yourself to somebody is an absolute experience of sovereignty and autonomy and freedom. That's the, 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 the interplay between, you know, uh, feminism in itself has, doesn't, you know, uh, is, a, is only an issue when people wonder, how can I say this and want that? Because every child that plays being a prisoner and a guard, for example, knows the difference between when they're playing. Yeah. Right. Nobody would want to be a prisoner, but there is something fun about playing the prisoner, for example. Right. You know, or the fireman, or the teacher, all of that. Um, <laughs> you know, or whatever you like. Whatever you... <laughs> you know, we don't then, judge. <laughs> we judge a little bit, but we're not going to say. And then, <laughs> the question about how you talk to men, I, I think that for me, when I begin to think about that question, it's really this. We are born women and we become men from chromosome on. Ma masculinity is a fragile identity. It constantly has to prove itself. It has to test itself. It has to go out into the woods in every culture. There's not a single culture where women have to go prove that they have now become women. And that makes the issue of being the threat so important. Why is, why is it such a vernacular to say, how do I talk to them without them feeling that it's a threat? Because there is a fragility underneath, otherwise you wouldn't be threatening. So you are not the issue, the threat is not the issue, it's the fragility that is the issue. Mm -hmm. And that's why I said, probably the deepest <coughs> a, um, uh, ache is humiliation. It's the humiliation. The word emasculation does not exist in the feminine, and neither does the word loser. And so how do you talk? You talk in a way that doesn't put people down, the, the same way that we want to be talked to, to. You talk in a way that lets the other person maintain a sense of dignity, that they can still have their, you can say no in a way that doesn't make them feel that small. No to anything, you know, I don't want to do this or that, it doesn't matter. But a certain way that leaves people not instantly diminished. And neither women nor men want to feel diminished or degraded by the, by the aggression of somebody else. But you've got to naturally assume there's some moment where you don't, sometimes I feel, as a gay person, you're always allowing for that, making sure that they feel comfortable and it's not returned in the same way, in that if they can feel badly for a minute, maybe it's okay because of, you know. Oh, feeling bad is fine. What I mean bad. is, feeling make them feel under attack. Is that a problem? No. You just can't, it just no. won't work. No, but I also want to protect myself. Right. I'm not interested in creating the wrath of somebody else. Right. 
So there's a way in which you set a limit that doesn't create an escalation. I don't want it. Sure, sure. But my point being is that right now, with all the, the backlash happened rather quickly, like two minutes but she's into. She's not it. talking about it. right. But she she's should. She has to worry about how she talks versus how they receive. And why in the world do we have to be so fucking polite to people all the time? That's all. That, you know what I mean? Like, so what if they I don't feel think you have to be polite to people. Right. I think that you, you want to do something that actually serves you well. Okay. All right. To get to what you want. But it often seems like women and people of color always have to say, be forgiving. But that's a oh, different no, issue. See, the, I, think I know that can be taken this way, but that's not... That, all right. We're going to disagree on that one. <laughs> I used to have to apologize for people being gay, and I'm fucking sick of it. All right, so um, two more questions. I accept. Uh, uh, two, two more quick questions. I don't have a question. I just want to thank you because I've listened to both seasons of, of your Audible podcast, and your insight is so beautiful, and, um, and your common sense is just right there. And I think really there are two crises going on. One is raising young men and boys mm -hmm. with a feminine side, which is so, so crucial. Um, and, and the whole social media, I, I have two young adult children and the things you were saying about, you know, turning the phone off and don't let that be the last thing you stroke. It's, you know, I raise my kids day after day after day that, you know, your relationships are the most important things in our lives. And um, I wish you could be in all of our schools teaching <laughs> our children to get off their phones. I mean, they are wonderful tools, but they don't, they don't build relationships. But it is hard because it's irresistible. They're irresistible. I Absolutely. <laughs> All right. But, but we need to teach it. Yep. Thank you. Uh, one back there. Right. Oh, back. Another question? Right here. Hello, Esther. I just wanted to thank you so much for your work. And uh, my question relates to there can be people who, particularly men, maybe they're uh, they're male al allies, so they, they understand what you're talking about. But what do you, how do you deal with, uh, you know, that hyper-masculine, uh, people who are going to see this as weakness and uh, who are going to be dismissive of it? How do you reach them and not kind of create a gulf between the male allies and men who are just going to see them as, as cowards and, and it's going right. to create an even bigger barrier? Numbers. It used to be that there was one divorced child, one child of a divorced family in a classroom, and so they felt very, very different. But once it was more than half the classroom, it became actually much more normative. I used to work for many, many years with interracial, intercultural, interreligious couples. That was my specialty. You know, and, every, and they were the only ones often, the only ones in their whole neighborhood. Well, then you feel like you are the, the other. But once it becomes a number, then, it, then the, the balance shifts. And if for that, you need to build the, capa the capital of people who gradually begin to stand up to the other men. In, and, and you first do it quietly, then you bring it into the public sphere, and gradually it, the, the, the volume rises on your side and diminishes on the other side. But that takes a decade. For this step, for what it takes a decade to get that. Do you but once it gets going, it can't be stopped. That's the important thing. Every one of those changes that took place, you know, it's what become, what, what, what once was the norm now becomes the stigma. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. So I want to finish up. Um, no more time left. Um, but when you, when you talk about that idea of how you do make changes and shifts, are you, you said you're optimistic. Are, are you hopeful that, that this is a moment um, it helped by so whatever it, it, everybody's talking about it for sure and social media helps that technology helps that and hurts it do you think it's a one of these great you know moments I am optimistic in an interesting way if I make it personal right. I have been working on relationships for 35 years I rarely went into companies before only if there was a crisis and it usually was called soft skills the soft what? The soft skills. Right. And I thought, what's soft about it? Yeah. But now, I am, I am I'm like constantly going to work on this subject. And in varieties of ways, the fact that relational intelligence, which implies power dynamics, right. implies trust, implies communication, implies listening, implies accountability, implies the whole relationship with the founders and all of that, 
that is that for me says something shifting that they're interested you know, in. they're interested they understand that you know product performance all of this matters data matters but there is a whole other reality that has to do with relationships and big data won't capture that right so if and you that's how I know something's happening, and I'm not the only one. Mm -hmm. There is something about psychologists or whatever, you know, people who have delved into this thing called relationships that has become essential to an economy of experience. And so people want to understand relationships. And I think that's what has happened that I see that makes me be positive. Right. And I think anything that takes apart, uh, that dismantles a system of oppression, mm -hmm. which this is a system of oppression, the, the, the harassment thing we talk about. I cannot think we will not be good, you know. Um, I, I, that's, you can see it. Because, well, because I am a child of two Holocaust survivor parents, yes, right. and I know it's oppression. Right. I just, it's like I, when fascism sets in, that's why he can't be let off the hook. Right. You know, no, I don't want to, I'm not, uh, you know, I don't know if you see my Twitter, am, but I'm not I a pal. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, I, 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 you know, it, it's like when, there's certain things that when you've grown up with some things, it's in your vein, it's in your blood. Right. So that's why I, I am positive because, because I, I don't mind the roar. I think it's very good. All right, I'm going to ask the funniest question at the end. It is related to Trump. If you would advise him and Melania, what would you do? What would be your first move? Because she looks unhappy. I don't know if it's just me. Look, um, I, you'd be nobody great. asked her for her opinion. I mean, she, you know, um, I, I, I don't know a clue about this woman, but I have a feeling from the little bit that I've listened to her and some of the interviews um, that she actually, um, <laughs> this is the way I sometimes say it. When you pick a person, you pick a story. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you are recruited for a play that you didn't audition for. Right, right. And I see this woman like she's in the wrong play every time it's not the character she wants to be like how the hell did she find herself she just wanted a green card <laughs> and i've been there <laughs> i also wanted a green card one day and and <laughs> you know and then she maybe have wanted someone with whom she could have an arrangement and everybody's entitled to their relational right. arrangement yeah. Yeah. but this this is not a play that she didn't audition for. Uh, so what would you advise her? What would you say? Get I, out. I, get no, out. Look, this, is, this would not happen. The, if she wants to get out, she wouldn't come to me. Yeah. And if she comes to me, she would be asking me, how do I tolerate this for another, I hope, not six years. Yeah. And what, what about to him? What would you say to him? You, look, everyone needs redemption, presumably. Not him, but okay. I would say to him... Um, you know, I'm in a bit, of a, a bit of a bind because when I work with men like you, I often feel that I overwork. Mm -hmm. You make me want to say all kinds of things while you're looking at me with contempt. And contempt is the number one killer of relationships. You have no intention to change because you have no incentive to change because that, what, that is what happens to men like you. So I'm not sure I'm going to be able to help you. But if one day you really want some help, just make, give me a call. All right, then. On that note, that's it for us. Thank you, everyone. If you could please exit out this front door, that would be greatly appreciated.